CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. <clears throat> Welcome to an NHL trade deadline edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, joined by my usual co-host Jonah Bronstein, but not from a usual location. There is no ficus behind him. He is at Key Bank Center, where he was uh, oh. just in attendance for Kevin Adams' post-trade deadline news conference. And, of course, you can't have trade deadline analysis in Buffalo without at Sabres prospects, Chris Baker. We have prospects to talk about. We have guys to, uh, to discuss, uh, guys who uh, maybe you haven't given much thought to. Uh, as a Sabres fan, not having watched a lot of Minnesota wild hockey, perhaps. Um, or Anaheim Ducks hockey, perhaps. Um, all right, so let's just start here. Um, Chris, let's get into it with the prospect aspect of things before we talk about Jordan Greenway, who's the headliner today as the new piece that fans are going to be excited about. Yeah. Uh, you, you delve in uh, to the prospects so much. What is just your general take on the value uh, of what was out the door versus what the Sabres have received uh, in regard to this trade deadline in a holistic sense? And then maybe yeah. we'll get into each trade uh, individually. I mean, they, they really didn't disrupt a lot of the good action that they have in the prospect ranks. If you think about it, you know, some of the currency that they spent was, um, you know, if you look at a forward that they used in the first deal that they made, Josh Bloom was kind of a utility type of player moving forward. You know, a two-way guy that's going to, you know, maybe fill a role down the line if things start clicking for him when he gets into the Vancouver organization. They gave up a, a depth goaltender that likely, you know, 99.9% .9 certain wasn't going to sign with them anyway. So they just really recouped the original trade value. Nothing really disruptive there from the prospect standpoint. You know, you can look at the picks maybe that were used to make some acquisitions like the Greenway and, and you know, delve into them a little bit. They gave a little value there. But at this time of year, did they really? You know, because the, the prices seem to escalate uh, on this day every year. I mean, some of these deals that we saw league wide you know, first round picks were thrown out like crazy this year. And I, I do think though, you know, we'll get into some of the, the acquisitions. They got some pretty good utility out of the return that came back here. Um, but no, non-disruptive. I mean, like if you walk away and th this isn't the time of year where you're making a lot of hockey deals. So, you know, a guy like uh, um, Yuri Kulik, Matthew Savoy, Devin Levi, those are, you know, your priority guys right now that you're really guarding. Um, they didn't give up anything like that. They didn't give up any of those secondary names like, you know, a Noah Ostlin, a, uh, um, you know, they didn't really give up any of the big names that you can see being surefire parts of the system moving forward, put it that way. Um, so they're in a good spot. I think they did. I did. I think they did fairly well considering what the goal was. The objective was to not disrupt future. And, um, you know, they always have an idea of guys they want fit in terms of age and, you know, their, their role that they're going to play. I think they filled some holes with what they got back. So nothing, nothing lost here, really. They didn't trade Yuri Kulich, which uh, you took some heat for having the audacity to even mention his name yeah. in my uh, most recent mailbag, the satchel over at the athletic.com. And you just mentioned him as, Oh, a guy that isn't untouchable. And some Sabres fans, uh, were they knocking on your front door? Uh, did they just burn things in your yard? I mean, what were, there was some, uh, there was snowballs. some. <clears throat> I think snowballs I were lobbed. Yeah. No, I mean, Kulik, I mean, look, he's a great player. You know, and I even said to you, and I mean, you know, you explained it well in the athletic piece in your mailbag, you know, I wouldn't want to trade him, but you know, the whole point is, is untouchable is a very absolute term. And there are players in the NHL that I would trade 
you're cool to acquire. Simple as that. Like, let's you understood. Know. understood. Yeah. <laughs> and I think most people did understand that, but I thought I, so. I, I got to kid. Yeah. yeah. All right. So well, let's people jump. were mad though. Yeah, people were mad. But let's let's, let's jump right into the the biggest deal. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonah. Did you well, have something? I just I just wanted to note that I, Kevin Adams did say Kulik was untouchable today, he, along with Matt Savoy. Yeah, at the trade deadline, maybe. But I mean, in three months, when you're making trades, the hockey trades, it's probably not untouchable. Jordan Greenway, the forward from uh, the Minnesota Wild, comes to Buffalo uh, for a second round pick, which the Sabres got from the Golden Knights in the Jack Eichel trade, and a fifth round pick. So that was the, the sexiest move in terms of what the Sabres acquired, a player who will be in uniform uh, quickly, uh, six foot six forward. Uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Adams uh, mentioned at his news conference about uh, teams trying to bully them. Uh, and this adds uh, some heft to the lineup, uh, but also notable because it was the biggest asset going out the door. The second round pick that the uh, Sabres got from Vegas, everything else was third round, seventh round, uh, you know, prospect here, prospect there. But the second round pick, what's your general assessment of uh, of that deal? Greenway for second rounder and a fifth rounder. I think so. I mean, the deal itself, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you always load to give up even a second rounder. Um, but a, a, what has been a second rounder for Buffalo the past couple of years isn't probably, you know, going to be like the, the second rounder this year is probably going to be a little bit deeper into the second round. It's not going to be one of those first eight picks like it's been recently. Um, I, I like the player itself. I think that he's going to fill that defensive forward need. I think if you can just look at his, you know, body type, if you watched him play, he's very good, um, you know, killing penalties, but also just his reach. He's very disruptive. He's got a long stick, big body, four checks hard, back checks. He's very in tune with the defensive off the puck part of the game. I think that's always helpful, especially if you can get into a playoff series and have a player like that that can be disruptive. He plays fearless. He's big body. He's not afraid to use it. Very good in front of the net. You know, it's going to be interesting to see kind of how they use him, how they deploy him. You know, he's probably a, you know, maybe a third line type of player um, in this in this environment right now. And they and they get two more years out of him as well on his contract. I think he's making, what, three, three per. So right. it's pretty affordable. Um, I, I think from a, you know, I haven't disliked him in Minnesota. It's been hard, you know, like they've. When you, when you look at that team this year in Minnesota, they haven't had a lot of great, you know, centermen to kind of put a guy like that with. But he did play a lot with Joel Erickson, who I liked, another defensive type of forward. I think that that schematic of how he was it used in Minnesota is kind of how he could be used here. And I, I just like the body type. I think he's going to bring an element, something that they don't have currently. It's a welcome addition to the team. And his offense, if he could be like a 12 to 15 goal guy moving forward, that's going to be good enough, I think, in the role that he's going to serve. His numbers are only going to go up. His numbers don't look good this year. I get that. But they should if he's used properly and you assume that Buffalo has better center depth than what Minnesota's had. Let's take advantage of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK's team coverage of uh, NHL trade deadline and go out to Jonah downtown at Key Bank Center. Like we, yeah. like we're covering a storm uh, a you know, on channel four right now. We got everybody out uh, in about on assignment today. Uh, what was the takeaway from what Kevin Adams had to say regarding uh, Jordan Greenway and the type of player that they feel they are plugging into uh, an organization that they were feeling pretty good about heading into this trade deadline? Tim and Chris, we're here at HSBC Arena. Oh, Key Bank Center. Just heard from Kevin Adams. You're fired. Yeah, yeah. I need more practice on my live hits. Um, You know, I I think the Sabres, specifically with the Jordan Greenway trade, but also with the Riley Stillman trade they made earlier this week, uh, they did what they set out to do this week, which was to add fringe pieces around the lineup that could help them bring some necessary roughness, um, fill a bit of a hole on their third defensive pair and maybe on the fourth line or the third line with a physical player, two players that bring necessary roughness and toughness to the team but without giving up any of the young players or the current players that are in the lineup, not disrupting the locker room. They didn't send out anybody that was in the lineup. They sent out Rasmus Asplund, who had been a healthy scratch in 11 of the past 17 games and seemed like he was losing his role here. 
and a, a couple of picks along with Josh Broom, but they didn't disrupt anything. The team that's on the ice tomorrow when they play the Tampa Bay Lightning is going to be just about the same team that had been on the ice prior to the trade deadline. So they added without subtracting very much. And I think they did make the team a little bit better in this push for the playoffs, but not in the way that many fans and observers had hoped that maybe they would get one of the bigger names or one of the more impactful players that were moved around the league at this trade deadline. And Chris, that goes right in line uh, with what you'd been saying all along, whether it be uh, when I talked to you for the satchel or when you've been on the podcast regarding not disrupting not only what's already on the team, but the pathways of guys coming up through the system. No major overhaul here. You're not clogging anything up. Um, the, the other two moves, and I guess let's let's bring them in here, but uh, I guess just to mention them, uh, and of course the Riley Stillman trade already happened, but the Sabres acquired two defensemen. Uh, mm-hmm. Riley Stillman, of course, from Vancouver for Josh Bloom, who you mentioned earlier, Chris. And uh, from Anaheim, they get Austin Strand for a prospect, Chad Prisky. Um, I guess, you know, what, what are your thoughts on on Bloom and Prisky? I mean, and then we can get into what the Sabres got, but I guess what did the Sabres give away here? They gave away, you know, higher-end AHL depth with Prisky. You know, I mean, if you look at, like, what they had in, in Rochester this year, you had guys like Ethan Prowl, Prisky, Jeremy Davies, they had a lot of experienced AHL defensemen. That's kind of what Prisky is. Prisky, and even with Strand, what they brought back to him, these are guys that are going to be mostly serviceable, playing kind of top four minutes in the AHL that have the ability to come up and plug holes as in the NHL as needed, which they're, if you look at, it, it was kind of the motivation, Jonah, like with the, the Stillman deal. Once they lost Casey Fitzgerald to Florida on waivers, you have this drop off from the guys that were on the Buffalo roster to those leading guys that were in, or I'm sorry, the, the, the roster in Buffalo to the leading guys that were in Rochester. You know what I mean? Stillman was at buffer. You bring him back. It's like a six, seven guy to rotate in strand is kind of in that vein, but probably more with a lean towards the AHL, if that makes sense. And Prisky was in that bucket too. Chase Prisky was a little more offensive minded. Um, and is, you know, from what I recall, now keep in mind, when he was out in the Anaheim system, I'm not watching a ton of West Coast AHL, but I do remember Strand from when he was in the Western League. He was just a solid player, didn't do anything crazy offensively. He put up really good numbers one year because he was an overage type of player, but he he was more you know, of your two-way defenseman look with, you know, maybe some defensive flaws. And that's why he's not in the NHL full-time. He's going to have the ability, though, to come up and plug holes as needed. If they have, like, may maybe like two or three injuries, he's going to be in the hopper to come up. Just like Jeremy Davies was. I think Jeremy Davies came up and played a game, didn't he? This year, or at least came up and got a call, a recall, I want to say once this year, kind of in that same bucket. Um, but no, to your point, though, Tim, this this was non-disruptive. Look, I think there were, there was a segment of fans that always want everything to happen quickly. Um, the reality is that the Sabres are not like one player away. Like an, they're not an acquisition at the trade deadline away from winning a series or two. They're in reality, they're a, a year away from their young players having the experience to kind of go back and figure out, okay, like Jack Quinn, I've been in this league for a season. Now I kind of have a better idea of what it's going to take to become a 25 goal scorer. Paterka in the same bucket. You can look at Matias Samuelson. You can look at Owen Power in the same. They're a year away from their core group of guys just having that other crude season under their belt to become even more effective next year. They're still having this goal this year. That's where Greenway comes in this year. He can maybe help with that push to get in and get a series of experience. under your belt, And that's the expectation. If they win a playoff series, you're overachieving. You follow what I'm saying? Like they're a group. They're not a singular entity away that they could have gotten at the deadline to really change the world. It's still going to require time and patience from fans, I think, to get the most output from the group, the group that they are developing right now. Greenway also NHL. brings some playoff experience that not very many players on the current Sabres roster has. And I see him as much as somebody that fills a bit of a role that they need right now for this playoff push, but someone who probably fills an even bigger role in next season and, and maybe the year beyond if they don't resign Zemgis Gergensen. He's a younger bigger physical player that that might have a bigger role 
on one of those checking lines in the bottom six a year from now than he has in, in these last few games of this season. 100%. It's that physicality. It's that grinding nature with a defensive mindset. You know what I mean? He's going to be leaned on more to shut teams down than score goals. But I do think that he's going to have the ability to score more goals in a more offensive system. This, this offensive attack that the Sabres are developing with all these guys up and down the roster is pretty, it's noteworthy. And he can fit into that with his skill set, his body, and just by being a fixture in front of the net and being a disruptor. So I like I, I like that acquisition in that sense. The Sabres are betting on Greenway's history with Don Granado playing in the U.S. national team development program. Kevin Ham said Don Granado was banging the table for this trade to be made, that they can reignite that offensive game and that ability and that maybe he can be more of an offensive threat. Uh, it probably will take some time. I don't know if you'll see him skating around scoring goals next week but maybe next year or, or into the later part of the season, refine that part of his game playing under Don Granado and in a more wide open system. Yeah, and no, see, this is good. I'm, well, I was, I was just, just going to say, I'm glad that Jonah's here and he was down at the, the presser because I did see like that quote about Granado banging the table or whatever it was, but I didn't get to hear Kevin's chat. So like, you're catching me up. This is good. I'm glad that we're doing this. Uh, I was concerned heading uh, into this podcast that I would uh, incorrectly call Jordan Greenway Chad Greenway, the former Minnesota Vikings linebacker, and instead I call Chase Prisky Chad Prisky. Uh, lest anyone think that I don't know his name is Chase Prisky, uh, but also just to remind some folks, he turns 27 in a couple of weeks, Chase Prisky. He was a sixth round pick. He's bounced around. He's a journeyman. So uh, you just to underscore that the Sabres did not give up much uh, for some players that can um, mend them up a little bit, that can give them a little bit of a push without disrupting uh, what they've built. Um, your thoughts, Chris, and I know we've talked about it, but for the record, because we've gotten through the trade deadline, we now know it's official. All doubt has been erased. They did not make a move for a goaltender, as some fans I think would have liked because it would have been you know, kind of a jazzy move and would have signaled, all right, we're going for it, which I think fans would love. And uh, it's tempting. Uh, yeah. But your thoughts on what the Sabres did, uh, not doing anything at goalie with the exception of trading prospect Portillo uh, to the Kings for a third rounder, which is he was originally a third round pick. So they get that asset back minus the investment uh, of time. Yeah, I look at what's out there and it's like they were just going to get more of the same of what they already have, really. I mean, you know, I know Cam Talbot's name was out there in the, the the rumor mill or whatever, but like, why the hell would Ottawa deal him? They're in the they're in a playoff push right now. They very well, you know, could use him there. So it's like he was the only name that kind of made sense to me. But like, if you're looking at some of the other names, you know, Ranta, injury concerns. Reimer is a three. You know, like you're getting more of the same there. I get that they didn't make a move on goaltending just based on what was out there. I don't I don't know what other names would have been available that would have been appealing to them to get. Um, and I mean, they could be in a position here real soon where, you know, not that you're going to lean on Devin Levi to play this year, but he's probably going to have to come in and, you know, I know that the rosters expand like basically now, right. That the trade deadline's done. Um, but he's going to come in here and in, in all likelihood, the meter is going to start running on his contract if he signs and he's probably going to, you know, he won't be able to go down to Rochester if that's the case. You know what I mean? Like if Levi comes in, so you might have him here soon too. And they might, you know, throw him out there for a game depending on what happens here, this is a difficult stretch coming up for the Sabres. You know, like, are those games going to be meaningful by the time Levi gets here? I don't know. But, um, no, I, I can rationalize I'm not really going big game hunting for goaltending at the deadline right now. It's just based okay. on the name. I think we're out there. What about Portillo? What about Portillo in terms of what you think he can be? How, what, did, what did the Sabres lose out on by not being able to fit him into their plans or make it seem like he was going to have a better shot to become their goaltender down the road? And – Adams also made it a point to say, which he didn't have to do, but he did, uh, that it was communicated to the Sabres that he did not want to play in this market. It wasn't that it, the organization wasn't necessarily the the best for him to for a path to the NHL. Uh, Kevin Adams did make it a point to say that Portillo didn't want to play in Buffalo. Yeah, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But I mean, you know, just as for the player itself, he's what that you know, does, though, for Kevin Adams immediately, he's won the trade no matter yeah. what happens, because people can look back and say, well, he was never going to sign here and he didn't like it. And we wouldn't have liked him. 
See ya. Yeah, no, it seems like he was, it seemed pretty clear that he wasn't going to come here, right? But I mean, right. you know, from a, like a goaltending, you know, the asset playing the position itself, he's gotten much better at the position since coming over here from Sweden. He learned the game pretty quickly in the USHL and he's won a lot of games in college. He's a prospect that has, you know, upside and that's whoever signs him, that's what they're getting. Um, the Sabres should be pretty comfortable. Levi coming in and, you know, Topias Lannanen being in the wings. They're going to let him just continue to play games and breathe and not micromanage every goal that he lets in over the next year and a half or so in, in Finland. And they're in a good spot. I mean, they're going to have to keep adding goaltenders to the mix via the draft and they will do that. But it's unfortunate with Pertillo because it would have been nice for them if he, if he did want to be in this market or whatever to come in and compete um, you know, that's the thing I don't ever get about these guys that, you know, like it's almost like they're afraid to compete with other goaltenders their age. It's like, if you believe that you're good, get your ass in here and, and do your job and, and win, win jobs, you know, going forward. But, um, no, Portillo's a big kid. Like what I've seen from him, like positionally, is just like his like leg strength and stuff. for such a big kid. He's like six foot six. He's not very strong in his legs. And like, that's something that whoever gets him wants to just build up his lower body to have more body control and, you know, th th we're going to get into the goalie nerd stuff. I won't go there, but you know, he has some things to work on, but he's, he's a good prospect in my opinion. I don't care what his stats say at Michigan this year. I find it interesting, probably coincidental, but that Portillo gets traded to the Los Angeles Kings, that being the same team that Cal Peterson ended up signing with when he didn't want to sign with Buffalo years ago, coming out of Notre Dame, it's different scenarios, but as Tim mentioned with the market, it does seem like maybe a team like the Kings, is more attractive uh, to these goalie prospects coming out of college. Chris, I wanted to ask you, had the Sabres made a move for a veteran goaltender, especially one with some term on the contract who, who might be projected as, as the goaltender going into next season and beyond, how might – had that possibly had an effect on their ability to sign Devin Levi? Is that maybe a reason why you don't trade for a goaltender that, that stays on the roster beyond this playoff push? I think so. I think that's why they didn't go big game hunting for a goalie last off season. They wanted to kind of keep that path clear. Um, they wanted to kind of get a transitional body in here. Hope that Anderson came back and get, that's how, I think that's how they ended up with a guy like Eric Comrie, not that proven commodity that could be a, a surefire number one. Not that they necessarily want to, you know, have an accelerated, you know, thing with Levi. But I do think that they wanted to keep Levi's head in the game and keep him, you know, just laser focused on getting through a season at Northeastern and becoming a member of the Buffalo Sabres organization. There's a lot of good energy with Levi and the Sabres. When he was here over the summer, he loved it. Matthew Fairburn did a great piece for The Athletic. There's your plug, Tim, for The Athletic. There mentions how Devin Levi, you know, just loves, you know, he loved the vibe in Buffalo, the people, his future teammates. And there was a lot of good energy. But you know, if they were going to go out, that, that was kind of the whole point. Like you kind of knew what they were going to do at the deadline based on how they acted this summer, last this past summer. Um, Cause there were options out there that they could have pursued and they elected not to. So, you know, right now it's the same thing, really. I, I've kind of, you know, I, I talked to Duffer and Marty recently on the Sabres channel about, you know, Ryan Johnson. If there's one, if there's one way that you want to show Ryan Johnson, that you want him to become a member of the Buffalo Sabres, have like 30 billion draft picks and take like two defensemen in the draft to keep his path clear too. You know, it's kind of the same thing with Levi, I think. There were some whispers that maybe the Sabres were looking to trade away UPL. Um, I don't know how true that was, but there was some, some tweets and, and things about that, that he might've been uh, in trade discussions. What do you think about the way he's developed and played recently and the potential that, that Lukanen still could be the number one goalie next season? So I think Lukanen could be a very serviceable NHL goalie. Do I think he's ever going to be a top flight one? I don't know. I don't, I don't get a feeling for that because it's just sometimes the way that he moves and he's inconsistent, like with his tracking, like I look at, you know, when you watch an NHL goaltender move, they don't have that stiffness in their body, their lower body, especially their hips that Lukanen has that matters. Like, especially on side to side plays um, the way that, you know, you can recover when you come out to challenge and then, you know, have to move to a post or, you know, all those little things matter when you're stiff and you're not that fluid mover, but he does win games. That's why I say he could be a serviceable NHL goaltender, in my opinion. Um, but I, you know, I think that, I think Lucan has done a good job this year though. I think he's still learning, um, you know, how to become consistent night to night. Like you look at some of the, the recent games post all-star break where the team in front of him just fell apart. One game he got pulled, right. 
I don't, I don't put all that on him. Like, do you want him to make some extra saves? Of course. But like the team in front of him has to perform. You can never leave your goalie hanging out to dry. And they've done that a couple of times, him coming out of break. They quit um, on him last night. They did. They did. That's one example. That's one example. The Boston game. Right. So, um, you know, I think that he's going to be a good. So to go back to your comment, like if there were rumors that like they were thinking about trading him, why? He's not yeah, breaking the bank. He's serviceable. Yeah. And he's still ramping up. Like you don't, the Sabres don't know exactly what they have with him yet, but I don't think that they believe that he's like a top 10, number one goaltender in the next three or four years. I don't, I don't get that vibe. Chris Baker, before we let you go, any closing thoughts or uh, uh, anything you want to add that uh, I didn't ask you about that you think might be germane to what the Sabres are up to lately? No, I think that there, you know, I think nothing happens fast in the NHL. There's no shortcuts. And, you know, I do, I get, I love that the fans are passionate about the team and they've suffered for a long time, but you know, this year is a really good move in a really good direction for the organization. I don't think anyone can argue that, but to think that they were like one acquisition away from a commodity, you weren't going to get Patrick Kane. I think the one that you missed on that would have been compelling would have been like a Jacob Chikrin. You could have a very serious kick. Well, let's talk about that. That's the big, that's the, that yeah. was uh, the the coveted acquisition that was on the table. And yeah. that trade took a long time to happen, which with it hanging out there uh, became that much more tantalizing as deals were being made. The Sabres weren't doing anything. Chitrin is sitting there. What are your thoughts about that trade not coming to be? So there's always things that we don't know that lead to how a trade went down, right? Sure. Like the, I mean, it's the, possible that the, the Sabres just didn't, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but right. I guess so yeah. in a, in a, I guess in a very vague sense with us not knowing the discussions, uh, the fact that he was available yeah. and the Sabres didn't get him for a cost that didn't, that would have seemed palatable. He's a player that I would have pursued aggressively, especially in retrospect, knowing what the price was. Um, you know, I was kind of surprised to see that that return for him because what we heard was like, what, a first, a high prospect and a roster player. And it didn't end up being that, right? But for that contract and the term that he had left, no brainer to me to have a serious, serious defensive just force of your top four guys that can all you have four guys that can play 25 minutes a night. If you get him, you know what I mean? That's a sincere luxury. Um, and it sucks that he went to Ottawa. It absolutely sucks that Ottawa got him. So, you know, but again, to your point, like, we don't know, like the initial reflex is like, I can't believe the Sabres wouldn't pay that. I'm sure the Sabres probably would have paid that, but for whatever reason, Arizona held the hammer and they elected to make the deal with Ottawa. It's probably as simple as that. Um, Kevin Adams talked about it a little bit today in kind of a circuitous way, but it was mentioned that, um, you know, the price that Arizona was asking from the Sabres was different than the price they ended up getting from Ottawa. And that it probably included some young players and prospects that the Sabres deemed untouchable or didn't really want to make that type of move. And then even just the draft pick compensation. I mean, the one thing Kevin Adams did say was that what was asked of them was more than what, the senators ended up paying so the senators gave up with the conditions it looks like it's probably going to be a first in two seconds i mean the sabers would have had to give up two firsts or you know what's more than a first in two seconds a first in three seconds yeah. it does seem like a lot and i think there were fit issues with chicken even though he's a probably an excellent player and and would have increased the overall talent but would he have replaced owen power uh, on the second power play and, and does he play alongside power play alongside Dali? how does that work do they really need another offensive defenseman or do they need more of a stay at home guy that, that plays well with the number one overall pick defensemen that they already have who are going to be doing huge contracts pretty soon? Here's the thing. Yeah. So the power play point that you make is right on the money because they have that already covered. The Sabres wanted physicality. It's clear. Greenway, physical player. Riley Stillman, physical player. They needed to kind of add a little muscle to the lineup. Chikrin does that. He accomplishes that, though. But I think to your point, like, is there a scenario where Arizona would have almost given him a voice and where he went? Because I could see him wanting to go if the because I think power play matters to Chikrin. Yeah, but he, been happy he wants with. he wants that role. Yeah, so it's like, but I but I don't know if like Arizona. If I'm the general manager of Arizona, Tim and I were talking about business earlier. Like, I'm running my business. If I'm in the position to run the business, I'm not giving this guy a voice. 
But in theory, did they as a favor for years of good service? And yeah, I, I don't know, right? But who knows? But no, I think you're right on the money though. Did they, they needed him for the physicality point, I think it would have helped. And the fact that he could log big minutes, but they didn't need him for the power play of the offense much because I think they have that cover from the back end. Yeah, and sometimes when it comes to dealing with a trade, and you you alluded to it, Chris, that you can't just take a look at a trade that is completed between two teams and plug in your team and that exact thing. There could have been, and this is theoretical, but I think it's plausible, uh, that in these discussions with the Sabres, they wanted a specific player that the Sabres wouldn't want to budge on or a certain asset. And in those negotiations, um, you don't want to feel like you lost the discussion or lost the negotiation. So by then, so if they take what they got out of Ottawa, but maybe it would have been too humbling for them to take the exact same thing from Buffalo. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just a theoretical yeah. about how it's possible that two teams can have two totally different uh, demands put upon them for a trade. And then it just kind of changes the tenor and, you know, sometimes there's, it comes down to as simple as, you know, uh, how, how good you feel about how you've been talking with that GM from the other team uh, over the course of the, the discussion. So. Yeah. There's some of that. Now it's, I'd, I'd love to know how that deal did go down and kind of where Buff, how Buffalo was positioned, what the ask was. Cause in the context of this whole, going back to like the Kulik thing, like I'm not trading Yuri Kulik in a deal for chicken. Cause I don't need chicken that badly. You know what I mean? But then you look at Minnesota, like, where Greenway just came from, say that team continues to go down the shitter and they're, they're a good team, but like a real caprice off. So like, I got to get out of here. And you like force this away. I'm probably offering Neary Kulik to get a player like that. You know what I mean? So like, is he untouchable? I'm still stuck on that. Cause it's going to piss me off. <laughs> well, we've gone full circle. <laughs> Chris, I know you got to go. Uh, thanks for making some time uh, to talk with the podcast here and, uh, and share your thoughts. I, uh, you're the guy, uh, who, who everybody needs to hear from on days like this and, uh, that you would, that you would do this. I appreciate it. And, uh, beers on me when I see you shortly. Yeah, we need, we need to do this more often and I do need a drink. So I appreciate you acknowledging that. All right. Chris Baker at Sabres prospects on Twitter, uh, follow him there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here and then uh, Jonah and I are going to come back, talk a little bit more Sabres. We're going to talk NFL combine. We're going to talk maybe big four basketball. I'm not really sure, but uh, uh, we're going to do a little bit of this, that, and the other. Uh, now that the big topic of the day in the save Sabres tread deadline has been addressed uh, with Chris Baker. Thank you so much. Thanks. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. Welcome back to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. Um, thanks again to Chris Baker, Jonah Bronstein has not left his perch in the key bank center press box. I might just stay here all night. We got a 1230 PM game tomorrow morning. And with the weather, oh, that's maybe right. Just, uh, sleep in this press box and be the first one here tomorrow. I, I would uh, encourage it. It's going to be a big day. You know, uh, I don't know. What is the plan for uh, Greenway? Uh, is he going to be able to get here in time for the game tomorrow with it being uh, such an early puck drop? You know, I, I don't recall if that came up specifically in Kevin Adams' press conference today, but my guess would be he is not going to play tomorrow too tight of a turnaround, and they might want to get him into a practice before he plays. And Riley Stillman had some in, immigration issues, but it took, I think three days from when they completed that trade before he was able to play for the Sabres. So I would imagine that um, Jordan Greenway does not play. Jordan Saturday. Greenway, native New Yorker. Canton, New York at North Country. Um, let's talk about the combine. I don't know how 
much you were paying attention, Jonah, during the week. I know that you were busy covering a lot of things for WIVB.com and in particular, the Sabres being very busy both on the ice and with the trade deadline today. But um, I got back from Indianapolis uh, late last night. Uh, it was, um, well, it was an interesting week to say the least. I, I thought it was just going to be my usual uh, trip to Indianapolis, a lot of networking. Uh, the Athletic holds its annual NFL Writers Summit there because we have so many of our writers who are there anyway. They bring in a lot of editors. Uh, editors who aren't even NFL uh, oriented. Uh, we had baseball editors and hockey editors and the New York Times folks were there. And uh, so we had meetings all day Monday. Uh, I thought I was just going to be working on a couple of features, getting caught up with some familiar faces uh, from from the rounds that I've been making since I started covering the NFL in 2007. And um, the Bills... Uh, announced Leslie Frazier was stepping aside and that became one of the bigger stories of the entire combine. And, uh, you know, maybe not, of course, uh, you know, not the same as, uh, one of the top picks getting, uh, having a warrant issue for his arrest. But, uh, a lot of people kept coming up to me asking me, Hey, what happened? Like what's going on here is there's more to this story, right? This is really strange. And, uh, I don't think there is more to this story from everybody that I was talking with. Um, on the record, off the record, away from the cameras and, and microphones, uh, at the bars, you know, making the rounds in Indianapolis as, as, as we do, um, which is why it's such a valuable, uh, uh, annual excursion. I think my take on it is that Leslie Frazier's burnt out from an incredibly arduous season, uh, Everything from the top shooting where he led the team in prayer. I mean, just kind of, and I mentioned that because it just accentuates uh, how much he's thought of and how much the team respects him. Uh, Kim Pagula's health situation, the weather, whether it be just moving a game, uh, forcing the Bills to play three road games in 12 days, which they won all three, uh, or the Christmas storm in which some 44 people, I think, and counting, I'm not even sure what the latest number is on that, uh, have died uh, in uh, Erie and, and Niagara counties. Uh, DeMar Hamlin, of course. And at the end of the season, after uh, another very strong statistical season for Leslie Frazier, uh, collapse against the Bengals in the playoffs, notwithstanding, which I don't believe was his, his fault necessarily. I think the team was just out of gas running on, on uh, psychological fumes. Um, I think Leslie Frazier getting no head coaching interviews a year after he got three, he interviewed for the giants. Um, oh shoot. Now I'm drawing a blank. It was the giants. Oh, dang it. The Dolphins and Texans, one of those teams. No, that was two years ago. Colts. No. Oh, damn it. I have it written down. And why can't I remember? Ugh. I don't know if it's essential. You can maybe uh, just say that he's had interviews in the years past. <laughs> it's bothering me, though. Not. It's bothering me. So anyway, yeah, so he, I'll, I'll find it here, you know, as we talk, but, um, oh, the bears his his, the team that he played for that he won the, won a super bowl with, sorry, back in uh, 1985, one of the greatest defenses of all time. He led him in interceptions. Uh, and, um, so he got passed over for all three of those jobs, but still, I think, uh, he was feeling that he was still on track to get back into a head coaching job. Uh, which uh, he hadn't had since uh, the Minnesota Vikings uh, let him go in 2013. And he even said back in July, he, he spoke on uh, the AP pro football podcast uh, with Rob Maddy uh, that he was frustrated and discouraged. Uh, and this was before, you know, the, he has another great season and then gets zero interviews 
Um, he was told last year, according to him, that, uh, you know, that there were teams out there that wanted offensive minded coaches. Well, things tipped a little bit this past season uh, or this past uh, hiring cycle. And the San Francisco 49ers defensive coordinator, D'Amico Ryans, uh, gets a job that um, uh, that Leslie Frazier was passed over for two years ago when the Houston Texans hired David Culley. I mean, people from the Bills who who were had experience with David Cully, who had exposure to David Cully, was shocked that he was the pick. Uh, and uh, here, Leslie Frazier watches David Cully go down in flames, and uh, and Lovey Smith uh, be one and done, and then they don't come back to him uh, and ask him uh, for an interview. Um, the Arizona Cardinals they hired a defensive coordinator the Philadelphia Eagles, Jonathan Gannon. And of their 12 interviews that they gave during this hiring cycle, the Cardinals had eight defensive oriented candidates, none of whom were Leslie Frazier. So look, the guy's getting passed over. It was a grueling season, as I mentioned. And I think that's, that it is, uh, it makes incredible sense based on the facts and also who I spoke with at Indianapolis. Uh, that he's just burned out and maybe having some doubts uh, about his future in the game and and his and and moving forward and he needs to he needs a sabbatical uh to maybe re- rekindle his his joy and passion and and all those things that are so critically important for a coach um but yeah a lot of people assumed when it happened that uh well there's got to be more to the story the bills decided to push him out uh, they're saying this to save face and I don't believe that to be true. Uh, you know, Brandon Bean said that if if Leslie Frazier hadn't made this decision last week, that uh, Frazier still would be the defensive coordinator. Um, and Frazier did. Uh, he didn't respond to my texts, but he did respond briefly to Ian Rappaport of NFL Network, in which he said he just needed a break. And I, Leslie Frazier is doesn't strike me as a guy who's going to lie or go along with a ruse. Just, just for to save face, he's got nothing to prove. Uh, Leslie Frazier doesn't need to save face, and I don't think Sean McDermott and and Brandon Bean are going to concoct a story. Um, so, anyways, I think it's I don't think there's anything sinister there's or conspiratorial about it. I think Leslie Frazier just saw what was happening in the NFL was coming off a rough season and just said, you know, it's just uh, he needed a break. So anyway. That's just my take on on that. I wrote a column about it, and I get into uh, way more detail, uh, nuance uh, in my thoughts and what I uh, unearthed uh, in Indianapolis uh, in talking with people around the league and and people from the Bills organization about uh, Leslie Frazier and then what becomes of the defense uh, as Sean McDermott uh, has to weigh who's going to call the plays. So anyway, um, that's that. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, and as you write in your column, it's 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 been Sean McDermott's preferred defense and style of defense from the moment Sean McDermott came in with Leslie Frazier. And even though Leslie Frazier has been the coordinator and calling the plays, it's not like they were at odds or the defense was being run in a way that Sean McDermott would want to change. So on the field, I don't know if you'll see that much of a difference. And you made an excellent point in your column about Al Holcomb being somebody who's familiar with the system, but he never worked with Leslie Frazier. He worked with Sean McDermott, and that indicates that, and that's something Sean McDermott said. You're quoting Sean McDermott there. That, uh, that would Brandon Mean. Correct. Right. Brandon Sorry Bean said. That, but um, uh, what I wanted to it's ask a tell. You, it was a tell, and it's uh, one of those things where if anybody wants to debate whether or not this was Leslie Frazier's defense or Sean McDermott's defense, it's clear cut that this is Sean McDermott's system. This is Sean McDermott's defense. It always has been. Uh, Leslie Frazier didn't hire these assistant coaches. There's a reason so many of these guys come to Buffalo with Carolina Panthers backgrounds. Leslie Frazier never coached for the Carolina Panthers. These are Sean McDermott's handpicked assistants, uh, not Leslie Frazier's. Uh, and so that's why, you know, and we talked about it on, on this podcast before, uh, and I've gotten into some Twitter skirmishes with fans who, uh, couldn't wait for Leslie Frazier to go. Uh, and Leslie Frazier is is uh, the reason these bills uh, can't get uh, 
uh, get over the hump in the playoffs. This is not Leslie Frazier's defense. Yes, he's the defensive coordinator, but this is Sean McDermott's defense, and it's not going to change much. It Yes, new voices, fresher voices, louder voices from assistants, but uh, and Al Holcomb's a new addition, uh, and that extra body uh, allows the Bills to move forward without having to make another hire. They had an extra coach on the staff on the defensive side with Al Holcomb. Now somebody just either gets moved over to the D.C. job or Al Holcomb slides into a position group um, or McDermott takes it over himself. But people were rooting for Leslie Frazier to lose his job uh, four months. And I went back and looked in the satchel. I keep talking about the satchel, uh, but it is one way for me to understand you know, what fans are thinking. And four months ago, uh, a fan uh, had had dropped a question in the mailbag about what are the Bills going to do if they lose Leslie Frazier to a head coaching job? Uh, and <laughs> it went from that to the Leslie Frazier's got to go. Uh, and what can we do now uh, with Le- if, if Leslie Frazier were to be fired? Um, so you're not going to get your wish of a brand new defense just because Leslie Frazier has gone. It's going to be the same defense. And in fact, it's probably going to slip because they can't bring back probably, I mean, barring wizard wizardry, um, Jordan Poyer, Tremaine Edmonds, Ed Oliver has been inconsistent. You have two very young cornerbacks who've been inconsistent and haven't been able to earn Sean McDermott's trust enough to stay on the field in a consistent way. Uh, You're going to need Von Miller to come back and and play up to a major contract at 34 years old with another reconstructed knee. And I mean, do we look at this, at the bills defense and say, Oh yeah, uh, they're, (laughs) they're going to be much better and then lose Leslie Frazier's experience. Whatever it was, 14 years as a coordinator in the league, five years as a player, four years as a head coach, uh, a a beloved coach among his players. I don't think the game's passed him by. I don't think he's aged out. Um, So Bills fans, as as I mentioned in my column, are going to get their fickle wish because they were afraid to lose him four months ago. And then a large segment of them were downright giddy that the guy was leaving the team on Monday. You know, I, I had a question, but then listening to you talk, it gave me a thought. Before you went, I think, you but, fell asleep. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, but, you know, the way you're laying it out with some of the roster changes and the Von Miller injury and the potential, as you say, that maybe the Bills defense won't be as good next year as it has been this year and years past. I mean, is there a scenario where the Bills fall from top of the league to maybe somewhere lower than that in defense and that makes – Leslie Frazier look better and maybe makes him a better head coaching candidate. If you see, Hey, look at how this defense fell apart without Leslie Frazier. Yeah, I guess, I guess they can go along with the same um, line of thinking that you would have with Eric B enemy. You know, what is he going to do with Washington? Will Kansas city have any drop off without Eric B enemy? Uh, will he, will, will Eric B enemy stock uh, slip a little uh, if Washington doesn't do much? Um yeah, I think that that could play into it, but I think it's really um, stark that Leslie Frazier had gone from um, five interviews over the course of the last four years, I believe it was. Uh, he interviewed for the Colts vacancy that Frank Reich got. And oh, by the way, got to see Frank Reich get fired this year. I mean, Probably not justified, at least not for me. I mean, I thought Frank Reich was doing a fine job, but imagine being Leslie Frazier and Frank Reich gets fired and Jeff Saturday becomes an NFL head coach. Now, you can't hire Leslie Frazier away from the Bills during the season. It's not like that's a missed opportunity for him. But then Jeff Saturday was treated at least as a legitimate candidate to keep the job after the season, Leslie Frazier did not get called in by the Colts for an interview. Um, The Colts did interview uh, six of their 14 uh, candidates were on the defensive side of the ball. So it's not as though the Colts were afraid of it. Um, They go with Shane Steichen, but I mean, imagine being Leslie Frazier and seeing all this going around the league. Josh McCown with zero head coaching experience being talked about for the Houston Texans job a couple of years in a row. Uh, 
you know, it's got to be incredibly frustrating. He posted a great season. I don't, I would be stunned if Leslie Frazier is, is lurking around Twitter or, or checks message boards uh, to see what fans are thinking or saying about him. But I mean, the guy's got to be thinking, what, what more do I have to do? I came to a team and played an influential role in totally rebuilding the culture uh, of a loser, a perennial laughing stock loser. Um, man of faith, beloved by his players, uh, overseeing a defense that is Super Bowl uh, contender worthy, uh, all that type of stuff, and to see his to see his career maybe waning. Um, does he get another head coaching? Op- Even if the Bills do struggle without him, he'll be he would be sixty four, or I'm sorry, sixty five in the 2024 season, um, and away from the game for a year. So head coaching opportunities, do they start popping up for Leslie Frazier? Probably not. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, I guess I could see this. If Brandon Bean loses one of his top assistants, like Joe Shane off to the New York Giants, maybe the, maybe somebody in the Bills front off, maybe Brian Gain gets a job as a general manager. And because uh, he likes what he saw out of Leslie Frazier and building a culture and being that type of guy that that he gets gets selected uh, for that role. But um, you know, I I think that Leslie Frazier must must be going through some existential stuff, probably. Um, I, well, it, it also makes me wonder. About- I mean, I'm, I, that's this is educated speculation. I'm not saying that I know this for sure. Uh, but in talking to people and, you know, that's, you know, but I, I also don't want to say in a definitive sense, because I haven't spoken to Leslie, I tried and I understand him not returning my text, but um, yeah, I, I think that's it. That was be what I would call educated speculation. Well, it seems kind of summarizing a lot of the different things you've mentioned that he's reached a point where he doesn't want to be a defensive coordinator anymore. And he, wanted to be a head coach and it hasn't happened and and maybe isn't keen on coming back at this point in time and being a defensive coordinator again. My question that leads me to the question I wanted to ask is what uh, just just a, for a semantic way, I I would say that Leslie Frazier is probably okay with being a defensive coordinator, but not with the knowledge that you will never be anything more. There's a difference there. You know what I mean? Uh I think he would like to know that he's still growing as you know and has he hasn't hit a ceiling. He hasn't maxed out. I mean, that's a pretty depressing thing uh, for any human being to have to contemplate. Uh, so I don't think he's like, like you said, I just wanted to, I just wanted to maybe just for the sake of, I don't know. Yeah. That was just for nuance or whatever. Yeah. I don't uh, of some of the things. I think he's, pro- I think he'd be fine to be a, to keep being a defensive coordinator if he knew there was still something more to come. Because sometimes and it's usually younger coaches, but coaches in this position that have maybe uh, gone as far as they they think they need to go as coordinators and want to be head coaches. Maybe they go become a college head coach, or, or I don't and know it's deserving. It's past, deserving but. to be getting these shots as opposed to Jeff Saturday and Josh McCown and probably a few other names that maybe I don't register with me, but as he or his agent are looking at it and saying, "Really." But anyway, I, I don't want to derail that, derail your point, which I have already done. And Leslie Frazier has been a head coach before, and he's a bit older. So he isn't really that type that needs to go and prove that he can be a head coach because he's already done it once before. But I do wonder, getting back to the question, is from your reporting and your sense, what are the chances that Leslie Frazier returns from this one-year sabbatical to be the defensive coordinator in the year? And even, I don't know if this is going to happen, but you know, if you talk about burnout in this time of year, you think of different NFL players who a lot of players want to retire in February or March, and then it gets a little later into the summer, and they're they're more excited about returning to football. And is there a possibility that maybe Leslie Frazier gets the, the defensive coordinator bug again in the summer, and he's back on the sideline or back in the booth by the time the season starts? Uh, I would say that that's a possibility. Um you know, I, I don't think Sean McDermott is one to slam the door on Leslie Frazier and say, hey, look, man, uh, we've been working at it too hard here. You can't just join in because and because that would uh, go totally against the point that I made at the beginning of this segment. Um, the, the defense isn't going to change dramatically. Uh, so I think Leslie Frazier could get right back into it without missing a beat. 
Uh, maybe you'd have to, you know, learn some of the guys who've been in their development. Maybe there's some new players, uh, some, some thoughts that are being uh, uh, applied to the defense, some adjustments that are being made, but that's stuff that, that happens every year anyway. Um, Brandon Bean did say that he would be the, that uh, Frazier would be the defensive coordinator if he, if he didn't want to step away. So uh, that suggests that if he were to change his mind, he could come back. Um, I think really where it could be a problem is if somebody else gets the title uh, and then you get into a situation where you're taking it away from somebody um, there could be that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, how the season plays out, but all right. So about 2024, um, the bills were non-committal about if, if Leslie Frazier were to, as he intends return in 2024, that it would be with the bills. They did not, uh, they were very, they were vague on that purposefully. Uh, they said, we'll see how it plays out because if they're successful without him, does he come back in? Is there a disruption? Um, what, he probably wouldn't want to feel he wouldn't feel comfortable enough taking a um, taking a, a different role probably than he's used to and probably wouldn't want to disrupt. I mean, uh, so maybe he would feel the need to just go somewhere else because, you know, great, you know, step aside type thing, uh, you know, let let things be in Buffalo if there's success. I think the the most likely scenario for his return to the Bills would be as if they struggle without him. And uh, he, there's a, there's a feeling that he needs to come back. We need to get Leslie back or it's a welcome return. But if Al Holcomb, Bobby Babich, Eric Washington, or John Butler start calling the plays and they're good at it, then the bills aren't going to want to disrupt that. They're going to want to keep, they weren't going to want to keep that continuity. Or I'm sorry, I guess I, and, and the big, the big, footprint, uh, Sean McDermott. I mean, he may end up calling the plays anyway, although he did say that it is more difficult for a defensive coach to call the plays as a head, as the head coach, because in between series, you need to be huddled up with your players on the sideline. And can Sean McDermott have his back to the field when the bills are facing a big decision in terms of game management, whether it be time on the clock, a fourth down situation, um, field goal, go for it, um, whatever, uh, whatever needs to have a replay. Um, can you do both? It's tougher for a defensive head coach than it is for an offensive head coach to call the plays. Uh, but three coaches did do it last year in the NFL. Brandon Staley with the Chargers, Dennis Allen of the Saints, and uh, Todd Bowles with the Bucks. So it, it is it is done on the NFL level, but McDermott made it a made it a point to mention that it can be tricky. So and McDermott's done it at times earlier in his, his head coaching tenure with the bills. He's taken over the play calling for portions of the season. Briefly in know, yeah, 20, 2018, I believe it was right. But four games, he's done that yeah. on a game day before, but now he has a, a not very experienced. I don't know if I want to call him inexperienced, but an offense coordinator who's only been the offense coordinator for one season. Yeah. He called the plays from the book. So from the booth, so I, maybe yeah. Know, Ken Dorsey's not on the sideline, so you have a guy making game management decisions while having to go through an extra step of telling somebody through a headset, "Hey, make sure you do." You know, it's it, or call time out here, throw the challenge flag. You know, it's it, it. You know, Ken Dorsey would probably have to make big adjustments at a time when the Bills would like for him probably to be as comfortable and feeling as seamless of a switch from 2022 to 2023 as possible, not adding more responsibilities and doing it in a different way. He prefers to be in the booth. So he should be in the right. booth. And the special teams. I mean, if Sean McDermott's so worried about the defense, he might make a mistake, like not kicking the ball out of the end zone when they have the lead with 13 seconds left in a playoff game. Right. That's right. Leslie Frazier had nothing to do with, Tyler Bass, I'll tell you that. Uh, even though everything has been pretty gauzy regarding what did happen in the 13 seconds, uh, Leslie Frazier gets blamed for that. I get it. There, there are all kinds of things all over the place that you can point to where the Bills have a defensive issue. But uh, as I made it, uh, the point in my column, you know, it's not like 
And I think there's a segment of the fans, the, the ones who are glad Leslie Frazier's gone, that I wonder if they believe that Leslie Frazier locks the door in the meeting room, it does not let Sean McDermott in, uh, will not allow Sean McDermott to make eye contact with him, uh, has uh, z- allows zero input from the head coach on the, look, this is Sean McDermott's defense. Leslie Frazier carries out what Sean McDermott wants done. Uh, and that's why, again, uh, I don't expect much schematic uh, difference. I don't think we're going to be looking at a brand new defense uh, in 2023. Right. McDermott's on the headsets. If he had a major disagreement right. with how often they're blitzing or the personnel packages. He, he... Or how far off the defensive backs are playing the receivers. I, you, you don't see Sean McDermott like uh, trying to get Leslie Frazier's attention and Leslie shutting him down on the sideline, you know. In fact, you see Sean McDermott coaching defensive backs from the sideline. He's very involved when, uh, you know, the other team has the ball. He's involved when I think the offense has the ball as well, but I think you see him more verbally coaching on the defensive side. He's very involved in in what goes on with that defense on game days and and I'm sure in practices as well. Uh, Before we go, I want to talk some basketball, Jonah. Uh, Big Four basketball, they're entering the final weekend of their regular season. It is March. Uh, and is we don't, March. it is March. Where did that come from? This is March. What is John, that? John Rothstein tweets that out like every time something notable happens in a game in March. I see exactly where it comes from. Um, big four basketball. Uh, can you give us a, a spin around uh, Western New York regarding the division one programs? But let's also uh, talk about Damon and NCCC, but big four, what we got? Yeah, well, this is the last weekend of the regular season for the Division One teams. And maybe I'll start with just, just to kind of get it out of the way. Division Two, Damon, men and women, are, the women are the number one seed in their conference tournament, hosting the conference tournament and trying to go back to the NCAA tournament where they've won two NCAA tournament games in each of the past seasons and they're the host team, the number one seed and the favorite to do that again and cut down the nets at home on Sunday. Uh, The Damon men are the number two seed and and will have to go on the road, but could uh, win their conference and go to the division two NCAA tournament, which they've been to the tournament before, but they have not won this conference tournament and gotten the automatic bid before. So if they're able to do that this weekend, that'll be a first time. The Niagara County community college teams are both regional champions and now go to a district tournament where they each need to win one game in, in somewhat of a semifinal situation in that tournament and they win in their end because two teams from the district will go to the national tournament for the women. They've been to the national tournament four years in a row. The men have gone four times in the last number of years. And I think it's been two in a row and triple C men with coach Bill Beeline are 28 and one number two in the country. And as good as they've been over the years, it's probably their best team. And I don't know if they'll win a national championship, but they're the closest they've been of all of these good seasons that they've had of being a national championship contender team and and the number two in the country. As far as the division one teams, all of them are finishing their seasons. uh, Tonight, UB men's basketball plays their last game senior night at alumni arena tonight. They're right now six in the conference. Uh, They could drop to, I I believe seventh, but not eighth. They've clinched their spot. They're not going to fall out of the top eight and go into Cleveland. But I don't believe I'd have to double check and look at the standings, but I don't believe they can get higher than fifth. And I think they're going to be, right on that sixth line, which isn't as good as they've been in years past, but they're not having a bad season. Although they are having, I, I think they're going to end up, they have a losing record, and I think they're going to end up with a losing record for the first time in 10 seasons. But they haven't had a real down season. Uh, they played a tough non-conference schedule that has affected their record, and they're going to have about a 500 season in the MAC. And I think they could win a game or two in Cleveland, but I don't really see you be pulling it out and winning that tournament and going to the NCAA tournament. And for the women, the women need to win tomorrow to even make the tournament to get in as the eighth seed. They also need a little bit of help, although there's only there's a certain scenario where three teams win and they win, they won't make it in. But most of the scenarios play out as a win in their end. So if the UB women win their final home game on Saturday, they're going to be the eighth seed in the MAC tournament, maybe even the seventh seed. If they lose, they're out. And that's not a good year, especially for a team that won the league and has been to the tournament the last number of years. But it's been an impressive kind of first season for Becky Burke, who lost the entire roster, replaced them all with a lot of transfers and fifth-year players, players from the Division II ranks. 
and they've been competitive more nights than not. And even though they don't have a great record, they've had some impressive results that, that kind of portend well for what Becky Burke's going to be able to bring filled with the new recruits she's bringing in, in the future. But record wise, it's one of the worst seasons that UB has had in a long time in both the men's and women's basketball. When you look at, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to disrupt. No, no, you go got, ahead. Go you, ahead. You got more to do, right? No, no, no. If you got a, ask if you got a, no, no, no. I, now and we'll move my on question is, team. is more wide ranging about the entire big four. So I'll let you do the bullet points. Okay. Well, let me just, uh, you know, you got the A10 yet. Yeah. The A10, Bon is in the tournament. I think they're about six. They, they had lost. No, no, actually, they, they were up to six and they fall. Let me look up Bonna's record. And, and while we're there, I'll mention that the women are one of the worst teams in the country and definitely one of the worst teams in the Atlantic 10 and not much going on with the Bonna women. Um, as far as the Bonaventure men, you know, I went out there. Was it last Sunday or was it two Sundays ago? And they were competitive. They were right there in the game in an overtime game against George Washington, but they lost it. That was the fourth of their fifth loss. They just beat St. Joseph's. Now here they are with the Atlantic 10. They were up to six and really pushing towards maybe that four or five line had they not lost the games they are. And now here they are at seven and below 500. They can even fall down to eight. But I do, again, I don't think Bana is going to win the Atlantic 10, but I believe in Mark Schmidt's coaching ability and they have some talent that I think they could do better than their seed, that they could pull off maybe an upset or two and go a round or two further than what their record and their seeding portends, but thinking that they could win four games in the Atlantic 10 tournament and go to the NCAA tournament. I don't think they have that type of team this year from an experience and a talent standpoint. The, you know, so tomorrow the Mac, the Metro Atlantic conference season will end with Canisius host in Niagara. Canisius is one of the bottom teams in the Mac, but they've won four or five. And I actually think they have an excellent chance of beating Niagara in this game tomorrow, which, uh, you know, as long as Reggie Witherspoon has been the coach at Canisius, they've struggled to beat Niagara. He's only beaten them two times. And, and Greg Paulus has only lost one game to Canisius in the four years that he's been there. But when they played up at the Gallagher center earlier this year, Canisius had the lead for more than 30 minutes of that game. And I thought if not for some foul trouble and inability to score late in that game, they probably should have won that one. But record wise, Niagara has a better record. They're fifth in the league, uh, 10 and nine. So they will be, you know, have a winning record in the conference if they beat Canisius and, and 500 if they don't. Uh, Niagara men, they're going to be in that 4-5 game against Quinnipiac. I don't know if they'll win that game, but they certainly could. They've beaten some of the top teams in the MAC. Again, not a team that I think is going to go all the way and ultimately beat a team like Iona to win the tournament, but a team that I think could pull off an upset or two and maybe make it to the final and maybe have a good showing at that tournament. The Niagara women have been the best team, not all year, because they had a very poor performance in the non-conference, but since mid-season and up until now and the preseason projections, the Niagara women have been thought of as the best local team, and it's playing out that way. They're up to the number two seed in the MAC tournament. They have their most conference wins that they've ever had. This is a team that's never won the MAC before, and they have an opportunity to get to the final. I believe they've only been to the final one time before. So even if they don't go all the way and make it to the NCAA tournament, they're still having one of the best seasons in program history with five players that are in the rotation, four of them start from Cardinal O'Hara High School, which are the only team in Division I, men or women, that have that many players from one high school on a Division I roster. And it happens to be a local Western New York team. With, and in mentioning that Cardinal O'Hara program, I covered last night, they lost the uh, Monsignor Martin Championship right. game to Nichols. They had won nine years in a row. Um, which is a pretty, even though they lost this year, that's a pretty remarkable feat that that program was able to do over that nine-year span. And that O'Hara can still win a state championship, even though they lost the league championship, the way that um, Nichols is going to go to the double-A playoffs and O'Hara has an opportunity to make it to the A playoffs. But And they still they have Division One players on that team. There's gonna, they have a sophomore forward that got offered by UB. So it's not the end of the road for O'Hara, but it was a bit of a significant end of their dynasty in a way, losing that game last night. So the Niagara women would be the answer to this question. So on the men's side, who had, even if it's an awful chance, somebody has the best chance to make it to the NCAA tournament. Uh, who of these four men teams have the best chance to win their conference? Cause that's what it's going to well, have to be. It's gotta be the Niagara men. 
just based on record and seeding, they're going to be the highest seeded team of any of the teams. And I think there's a bit more parity in that league and more ability. Iona hasn't, they did win the league, but they've lost as the number one seed in two of the three years with Rick Pitino. And that could very well happen again. And Niagara didn't beat Iona this year, but they beat them last year. Niagara's beaten Ryder and Siena, some of the other top teams in the conference. So I do think uh, Niagara has the ability to beat these teams and make a run in that tournament. I just, because they've been inconsistent and sometimes the offense doesn't score very well, I don't really like their chances of winning three games in three days against three good opponents at that tournament. But I really wouldn't be surprised if they won one or two and made, you know, I think both Niagara men and women, I think, could make the final, but I would be surprised if they won the whole tournament. All right. Good stuff, Jonah. I feel like this is the most comprehensive show we've had in a long time. Sabres trade deadline, NFL combine, Leslie Frazier, big four well, basketball, real, men and women. Real quick, I'll throw another thing in there that we don't talk about a lot, but the Canisius and Niagara hockey teams, the Atlantic Hockey Tournament starts this weekend. Canisius is the number four seed, hosting Army in a home series, best of three series that starts tonight and, and would run through Sunday if that goes three games. Niagara's on the road. I'm forgetting who they play, maybe American International. Um, Niagara came one point away from being that fifth seed that would have played against Canisius in the first round. That might have been a fun thing to pay attention to. But from a media perspective and even a fan perspective, there's a lot going on at the same time now. The NFL Combine, the NHL trade deadline, the Sabres making their playoff push, uh, March Madness, college basketball, and this is the biggest week for high school. Free agency Plus, coming up. Uh, right, right. Hell, baseball's on the horizon. Yeah, and it's things are heating up in the NBA if you're into watching that. It's post all star break, post trade deadline, and getting ready for the playoffs there. Well, Jonah, thanks for this. Um, uh, sure. And thanks to everybody out there for listening. Uh, it's, uh, it was a jam packed show. And hopefully, you stayed to the end uh, that I didn't put you to sleep while pontificating about Leslie Frazier, like I did Jonah. He forgot his question. Well, no, I actually came up with more and more questions, the more oh, I see. salient points that you made. All right. Well, that makes me feel better. And uh, thanks to everybody out there uh, for your continued support of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. Please follow, subscribe, uh, hit that like button, give us five stars or hell, give us one star. I don't care if we deserve it, if you think. But uh, give us your give us a rating. I, 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 you're supposed to push that stuff more often. They say, yeah, I think the it's content uh, gurus tell you, you got to do that stuff. And I don't, that's, I don't ask that often. That stuff's important in any way. You know, if you're a listener to this podcast and you can recommend this to your friends or your family or other people that, you know, that listen to local sports, Buffalo sports podcasts, um, you know, that would be very much appreciated. I would appreciate it. Jonah would appreciate it. The American people would appreciate it.